seeing you all again, STEM teachers from around the world looking for ways to deliver engaging interdisciplinary STEM classes. In our last session, we talked about robots as problem solvers, discussed how they work, and even got to drive our own virtual robots around. I hope the first session met your expectations and that you, and that you are now ready for session two, during which we will discuss sensors and how to put them into good use with loops, conditions, and more. Before diving into the fascinating world of sensors, let's have a quick look at what we covered last week. Last week's session focused on the robot's outputs, specifically the motors, as they enable our robot to move around. We started our Coder Z rulebook, and we can now go back to it, see if a week later it still makes sense. By the way, what mission did you like most? Was there any specific mission you felt stuck with or enjoyed immensely? Let us know in the chat box. I can see you like the TNT mission. We'll get to that today as well. So to continue the recap, here is the first rule we formulated last week. Basically, it means that for robots, such as the EV3 robot educator, in which we have a right and left motor, we need to power both motors at the same speed and the same direction in order to move in a straight line forward. The second rule is actually a variation of this rule. Let's have a look. Backward direction can be set by using negative speed or changing the direction in the drop down menu. Choose either as choosing both negative speed and backward as direction will drive the robot, you probably guessed it, forward, just like multiplying two negative values. The result will be positive. We also found out that powering just one motor will make the robot turn toward and around the other motor. This is a great way to turn, but not the only one, as explained by our next rule. The last rule is actually an expansion of the previous one, saying if both motors rotate at different speeds, the robot will turn toward the slower motor. The bigger the difference in speed, the tighter the turn. Are there any questions before we move on? Our team is standing by the chat box to answer all your questions. Excellent. These rules help us understand the functionalities of our robot's drive train. Coder Z has an additional block that once you understand how to drive the robot, can do the same using only one block. Write down a number between one and 10 to let us know how confident you feel with driving your robot so far. One would be, I have no idea. 10 would be, I am the master. Let us know how confident you feel with driving your virtual robot. Okay. I can see some high values, I can see some low values. We will repeat a little bit of, of last week's session during today's examples, but if you don't feel confident enough, ask the questions uh, through the chat box and we will do our best to, to, uh, to reply. And after the session, you can always practice some more. And as this session is being recorded, you can also watch it again and as they say, practice makes perfect. I can see that there are many masters here with us tonight. This means that you are now ready for the ultimate power in robots driving, the one block to rule them all. Meet the drive block. The motor blocks we used last week were used to instruct an individual motor. The drive block instructs the robot by synchronizing both left and right motor. Let's see how it works.
In this mission, all we have to do is go forward. The drive block power setting is used as the speed for each of the motors. Drive power of 100 would mean both motors at full speed ahead. Sounds easy, right? Let's enter 100 in the power setting of the new drive block. Keep the setting of direction to forward and play the simulation. We can see that the robot moves forward, powering both motors, resulting in a drive forward. Let's move on to the next mission. In this mission, we need to drive the robot backward. While this next mission is loading, can you tell me what to do in order to change the robot's direction, make it go backwards? Write it in the chat box. Okay, there are a couple of suggestions that say let's add negative power, and that is correct. We can also change the direction from the drop-down menu of the drive block. If we want the robot to move backwards, we can either use positive value with backward direction or negative value with forward direction. This drive block will tell our robot to go backwards due to the negative power value. Let's hit play and see if it works. Excellent! Moving on to the next mission. Now we need to turn. Turning using the drive block is a little bit more complex. To turn the robot, we will need to use something called the steering option. This steering option is available from the drive block setting menu, which is accessed from this blue icon. We can check those boxes to add to our drive block the steering parameter that allows the steering, and if we like, a duration parameter to control the duration of the turn. Duration is in milliseconds. Just like we tried in the previous missions uh, of the previous session, this is a bit of trial and error, finding out the right value to complete a turn. In this case, we need to turn at 90 degrees. Let's try a value and then tweak it if needed. As for the steering, well, we already know we can turn in different degrees of the curve. So before we move on, let's have a look at the steering rules, which we have prepared for you. The steering parameter, as you can see from this table, can allow us to create any type of turn we like. Just like speed and power, steering is a vector. The magnitude controls the turn radius. The sign controls the direction of the turn. Positive values of steering will create turns to the right. Negative values will create turns to the left. You can practice the drive block at home, and you'll see it's the easiest way to control our robot. Check the rule book when not sure, or just try out different values. Codozy will never explode in your face, so don't worry. We can see from this table that to create a point turn, we need a steering value of 100. If we go back to the mission, we, see that we, we can see that we need to turn our robot to the left. This means that we will need a negative value to drive it to the left, to turn it to the left. So we have minus 100 as a steering value. This will turn our robot to the left at a point turn. Let's run the simulation and see how it goes. We may have to tweak the distance, the, the duration in milliseconds, as we can see, we turn too far away. I have a question for you. Is there another way to lower 
the distance that the, or the degrees that the robot turned in other than lowering the duration. And I'll repeat the question, is there another way to change the distance that the robot turned at other than lowering the duration of the turn? Well, some of you said to change the steering, that is one way of doing it, but it's a little bit uh, more complex. Uh, changing this value will create different turns that are not point turns. But if we lower the speed, we can create in the same duration a shorter distance to be covered by the robot. The drive power and the duration can both affect the distance that the robot will cover. Excellent. Again, if there are questions, feel free to ask them in the chat, and, we, and the team will be uh, will answer you the best they, as best they can. It is time to talk about sensors. Those electromechanical devices that convert physical quantities to electricity. Robots need input, information. They need to know what goes on around them so they can adapt and react accordingly. We already covered washing machines last week, so let's talk vacuum cleaners this week. Your Roomba vacuum cleaner needs sensors to avoid bumping into obstacles or from falling down the stairs. If you have a little robot vacuum cleaner at home, send us a happy smiley. If not, a sad smiley is completely understandable. On the front of the Roomba, like most robotic vacuums, there is a bumper. The bumper is connected to a touch sensor so when the robot bumps into a chair or a cat, the touch sensor is pressed. Touch, sen touch sensors are like light switches. They can be either pressed or released. When pressed, it sends a high voltage to the robot controller. When released, a low voltage. These states are translated by the controller to the values of true or false. This is important so we can interpret the data coming from the sensor. When we ask for the touch sensor value, we will get true when pressed, false when released. We can make decisions upon it. Let's move on to another mission. In this mission called Around the Corner, I want to show you something really cool. In this session, we promised you'll get to see the world from the perspective of the robot. In Coder Z, we can easily do that by turning on the heads-up display. The heads-up display can be turned on from this icon above the simulation. And by clicking it, I can add a layer of data, showing me in real time all information flowing in from the sensors. Turning on the manual control from this icon next to the HUD icon will allow me to move the robot around using the arrow keys on my keyboard. Notice how values on the HUD change as I drive around in this scene. By zooming all the way into the robot, I can also activate the first person view and become the robot. It is now very easy to compare how we see the world and how this, with the way that the robot does. It sees data, both values like numbers or false in the case of the touch sensor. When we want to talk to the robot and instruct it based on the sensors, we need to talk data. We need to talk numbers. So let's do just that. I have pre-constructed a code 
to use with this mission. You may not understand it yet, and that is fine. I'll give you a minute to read it and send us by chat what you think will happen. Try to read it as plain text. It might not be fluent as Shakespeare, but I think it will make some sense, help you try and figure out what the robot will do. Okay, let's run it and see how it goes. As you can see in the simulation, and as some of you suggested, the robot will drive until its touch sensor, which is this fellow here, touches the fence. It is pressed by the fence, changes the value to true, and accordingly stops the robot. Let's break down this space code into segments we already know, see if we can, if we can make more sense out of this code. Starting at the end, we have a drive block that is set to stop, as the power is set to zero. Before that, inside this yellow block we know nothing about yet, there is another drive block, configured to drive the robot forward. So we have a drive forward block and we have a stop block. In the simulation, and I run it again, we can see that the robot drives forward. We can see that it stops as soon as the touch sensor presses the fence. We can see in the AGD how the value changes and stops the robot as well. And the robot stops as well. This code that we have can be read as pseudocode. Repeat while the touch sensor is pressed false meaning it's not true, drive forward. By looking at the simulation, we can see that the robot goes forward while the touch sensor is released. Once the touch sensor is pressed, that part of the program stops, and the next command to stop the robot is executed. Any questions? Let me repeat what we have in this code to make sure we are all on the same page. We have this block that we have not yet been familiar with, but we can see that what it instructs the robot to do is to drive forward until the touch sensor is pressed, meaning it returns a value of true. So while it is not true, it is false. It will go forward, and once it is true, it will move on to the next block and stop the robot. The yellow block that starts with repeat while, which we just saw, is the main command used in our program. Let me explain. In programming, repeat while is called a loop. A loop is instructs a program to do something while or until a condition is met, allowing repetition of the same code over and over again without repeating the actual commands. In coding robots course, we investigate the code behind a stoplight to help students understand the concept of loops. The program of a stoplight does not consist of infinite commands turning the lights on and off over and over again. The program for a stoplight is very basic, turning each light at each turn, and then it sits in a loop. The loop will create that same functionality repeat, the same sequence to repeat over and over again. 
So let's go back to our mission. As you can see, the while block has other blocks connected to it. Inside, there is the drive forward block. Next to it, there is something that we call in programming a condition. There is a compare block. We can see the, oops, just a second. We can see the equal sign here, which makes this a compare block that allows us to compare two values. And we compare it between the get touch is pressed block and a false value. So this creates what we call in programming a condition. This condition is required by any while loop to tell it whether to repeat the block inside or move on. Let's put it into a rule. It will make more sense that way. So what we have in our code is a repeat while loop with a condition and a set of instructions. What is a condition? The condition determines whether the set of instructions will be executed or not. Our set of instructions was just to drive forward. The condition under which the robot will drive forward is for the touch sensor to be false, meaning released. Let's go back to our mission. What do you think will happen if I change the condition here from true, from false to true? Now the Please bear with us while we restore the audio. Just one second. Okay, it seems that we had a, a miscommunication and, and the breakdown of communication, but we are now back on. Can you hear us? Can you write in the chat box if you can hear us now? Excellent, my apologies. Let's go back to my question. What do you think will happen if we change the condition, the value in the condition from false to true? Write down the answers in the chat box and we will put it to the test in a minute. We can try and read it as a sentence saying repeat while the touch sensor is pressed true. So it means that when the touch sensor is pressed, run this block. What do you think will happen? Great answers, correct answers. Our new condition now says that while the touch sensor is pressed, drive forward. Since at the beginning of the code, the touch sensor is released, the condition is not met. So the loop doesn't execute the set of instructions within it. And the program moves on to the following command, which is to stop. And as you can see, I'm running the code, but the robot doesn't move. 
to validate this, we can add a negative value here. So we can see that the robot will turn backwards immediately as the program starts. Let's try it again. We can see the robot going backwards because this condition is not met, this set of instructions does not execute, and the program moves on to the next command. Now, when we understood how we can stop the robot once it hits the wall, which is drive forward while the touch sensor is not pressed, and then stop when it is, we can try, and let's run it, make sure that it works. Excellent. So based on this condition, we can try and create a new one that will instruct our robot to turn 90 degrees to the right. That is a bit of a challenge, but together we can do it. Instead of while touch sensor is false, we would need something like while turn angle is less than 90 degrees. Can we construct such a condition? Let's start with what we know. I'll duplicate the entire program. So now we have that while loop with the condition. And at the end of it, we have a stop block. Now we want to turn to the right. So let's tweak that drive block and make it turn to the right. We will set steering. And can anyone help me with the value we need to make the robot turn to the right? Should it be zero? Should it be 50? Maybe minus 50 or 100? Well, since we need to turn to the right, we would need a positive value. Since there is very little wiggle room in the corridor, it is preferred to make the turn a point turn rather than a curved turn. So we will use the value 100 to create that point turn. Now let's examine the condition. It is understandable that the touch tensor is not relevant here, and so does the false. We want to compare a compared value to be 90 degrees, but we don't know against what to compare it. Any ideas what that thing can be? Write it down in the chat box. To help you out, I'm opening the sensor category. We have here all kinds of sensors reading all kinds of data from the robot. Is there something that can help us? Write it down in the chat box. Esteban, you are correct. Cheryl, you are correct as well. So it is time that we meet a new sensor. Meet the gyro sensor. The gyro sensor or gyroscopic sensor is by far my favorite sensor because it is so interdisciplinary STEM. Let's investigate it just a bit before moving forward. Gyroscopic sensor measures rotational speed or turn rate. A car can drive at 60 miles per hour. That is linear speed. It means that in one hour, it will cover a linear distance of 60 miles. Rotational speed is how fast something is rotating. Let's explore an example. Feel free to use it in your STEM class as well, as it relates to more than just robotics. It involves math, physics, and geometry as well. Have a look at the clock. It has three hands for seconds, minutes, and hours. Each end revolves around the same center, but at different speeds, different rotational speeds. My first question is easy, but pay attention. What is 
the churn rate of the second hand. How many degrees per second does it turn? Don't trust the clock is not ticking. How fast in degrees per second does the second hand turn? The best way to approach it is to see how long it takes it to complete a full circle. 360 degrees are a full rotation and it takes the second hand 60 seconds to come full circle. So the answer is 360 degrees per 60 seconds or 6 degrees per second. You can now guess what comes next. My next question, as you might have, might have guessed, is what is the turn rate of the minute hand? How many degrees per second does the minute hand turn? We can see that the second hand is much faster, of course, but by how much? Let's see how long does it take the minute hand to complete a full circle. Full circle is still 360 degrees, and it takes the minute hand one hour for 60 minutes to complete. So the answer is 360 degrees per 60 minutes. We can apply some math to it and convert it to degrees per second, which brings a result of one degree per 10 seconds, or one tenth of a degree per one second. You can try it at home and check the speed of the hour's hand. But for now, we will move on. Now we know that if a car drove for one hour at 60 miles per hour, it covered a distance of 60 miles. That is basic even without looking at the equations. If my second hand turned for 60 seconds at a speed of 6 degrees per second, I can calculate to find it turned 360 degrees in total. The gyro sensor does just that. It calculates the total degrees the robot has turned based on the turn radio on the turn rate and total time we do not need to calculate it ourselves but while this is the gyro's job we need to remember this is a calculation of the turn angle and it is based on time as such it is prone to errors especially at high speed that is why it is a good common practice to turn at low speeds. Let's give it a try in our mission. Back to our code, what I'll do now is add that some I'll add that something that we were looking for. Angle mode block and put it in our condition. So instead of a touch sensor that returns a value of true when pressed, false when not pressed, we will use a gyro that can give a value that is the turn angle of the robot. Our program is almost complete. Let's just open the HUD and look at the gyro values as the robot turns to the right. I'll turn on the manual control. Let's stop the program first. Turn on the manual control, and as I turn to the right, look at this value of the gyro. We can see the values are decreasing as I turn to the right. If I turn to the left, we can see the values increase. This is an internal issue of the gyro sensor. We will need to play along and change or determine the compared value accordingly. So, help me out. What do you think our condition should be like? While the gyro gets angle is higher, bigger than, minus 90. We want the robot to turn until it reaches this value of minus 90. So, how should our condition look like? Should we use while it equals, maybe lower, lower or equal, 
write the answer in the chat box. I see some mixed answers, and that is fine. I'll show you a nice trick how to resolve that kind of a question. Our robot, when gets to that part of the program, has a gyroscope angle value of zero. Zero is higher than minus 90, and we want it, while at this position, to start its turn to the right. So since zero is higher than minus 90, we will set it to higher and add the value minus 90 to our condition. We can test it out even without running the simulation. Let's look at the current situation of the robot where the gyro sensor gives a value of minus 70. While minus 70 is higher than 90, is this condition met? Is minus 70, minus 17 higher than minus 90? The answer is yes, so the robot will turn to the right. What would happen as we move closer to our goal of minus 90 degrees? Minus 77 degrees is still higher than minus 90. And as long as the values are higher than minus 90, it will continue its rotation. When it gets to minus 90, well, minus 90 is not higher than minus 90, minus 90 it equals. So at this point in time, the loop will stop instructing the robot to turn and will move on to the next block to stop the robot. Let's give it a try, but before that, let's apply the common practice I discussed earlier. Let's turn at a slower speed. Are we ready? I think we are. Let's try the code. You can watch the values from the gyro and the touch sensor as they change throughout the session. Excellent, we were able to complete a 91 degree turn. The physics engine of the simulation relies on real physics. There is a, a momentum to the robot, and that is why we use low speed as 20. At higher speed, there will be more momentum and the robot will overshoot even more. Now, all we need to do is add the final touch. Drive forward for the robot to reach its objective. We already know how to drive forward. We so just duplicate that block and add a positive value to make it go forward. Excellent. That's great. Now, it may feel like we've made little progress, that we just turned our robot at 90 degrees. But actually, what we have covered is much more than just turning. Let me show you what I mean. Let me show you how we can use the same concept as we just used to solve new problems using new sensors. Let me go to a previous mission that we, that we solved last week. Do you remember this mission with the TNT? We needed to stop the robot before hitting the TNT. We used time-based motor blocks to solve this mission because that is all we had. But that is not the best way. If someone was to move the TNT further away from the robot or closer together, that program would fail. Well, we now know more and can try together to give it a go using our sensors. Let's construct the same code together, the same code that we used in the previous mission. I'll need your help. So write down in the chat box the blocks you think I will need 
to solve this mission. Okay, we of course need the robot to drive forward. So here is a block to make the robot drive forward. Excellent. We also need a block to stop the robot. So here is a block to stop the robot. In the previous mission, we had the while loop. Let's use it again. We can find it under the control flow category. Here is the repeat while loop. We want the robot to move forward and then stop before it hits that TNT. What we did is use a compare block, which is from the data category. And we used it to compare two values, the touch sensor, which is under the sensor category, and the value of false. This is just a part of the program, and it's identical to what we did in the previous mission. Let's run it and see what happens. I will open the HUD and we can have a look at the touch sensor. Well, something bad happened, and I know that I promised that Coder Z won't explode in your face. Well, I was wrong, but this is not dangerous, so don't worry. Well, the thing is that for this specific mission, we could not use the touch sensor as we do not want to touch the TNT. It explodes. So, if there was only a way for us to use another sensor, maybe, and see that TNT from afar, so we can stop before hitting it. Well, we, were, we failed not because we were wrong, but because the touch sensor was the best choice. It reacts to touch, and unfortunately, so does the TNT. So let's try another way. Maybe we could stop the robot just before we touch it. To do so, I want to show you a new sensor. The ultrasonic sensor. The ultrasonic sensor, while the technology behind it is very much STEM, is something we will not go into. But if you like, uh, you can check out Coding Robots Curriculum that discusses this in greater details. For now, all we need to know is that the ultrasonic returns a value in numbers representing the distance from an obstacle in centimeters. Its maximum range is 250 centimeters, centimeters. Anything further away, it will not see. It can also detect obstacles that are only right in front of it, like that TNT that we just blew up. Let's try and use this sensor in our program. Instead of using the touch sensor, we can try and use the ultrasonic sensor. Looking at the sensors category, we can find a get ultrasonic, get distance mode block. This block will query the ultrasonic sensor and return a value in numbers in centimeters as to its distance from an obstacle. I would like to use, again, the manual control and the HUD to see how far away from the TNT we want to stop. Let's open the HUD again, have a look at the ultrasonic sensor, and start moving toward it. We can see the values decreasing as we move closer and closer to our TNT. The ultrasonic sensor, which is this sensor here, in between the wheels says that the distance to the TNT is 23 centimeters. We took a, another step forward just to collect that last bolt, and now we can see the value is 18 centimeters. So, can you try and help me out? 
what do you think should be our condition to make sure the robot stops at a distance of more or less 18 centimeters? Should we use equal, greater than, lower than? We can use the example that I gave before. When we start the program, we want the robot to move forward. What is the situation? We see a value of 145, and then it drops down. Are these values greater, lower, equal to 15? These numbers are, of course, greater than 15, which means that our condition should be while the ultrasonic value is higher than 15 or 18. Let's try out 18. So while the ultrasonic gives a value of more than 18 centimeters, the loop will execute this command driving forward. As soon as the distance lowers and reaches 18 or less, it will move on to the next command and stop the robot. This is the same code as we used before. We only changed this, the condition. We can see that we stopped at 11 centimeters. Again, the robot has momentum even though it's a simulated robot. If we lower the speed while driving forward, we can lower that error from 18 uh, to 11. So that is what we did with the gyro sensor. And since we did not bump into the TNT, there is no need for it now. So, as you can see, while keeping the same structure, we were able to use a new sensor that we did not know before and create a new and better, more compatible behavior of the robot in this specific mission. This way we can instruct our robot to adapt itself to its surroundings, limited only by the way it sees the world with its sensors. The condition part of the loop is something highly reusable. You will use this often when programming your robot, so don't worry, you'll get a lot of practice. Looking back at what we did today, throughout most of the session was to take a problem and break it apart to smaller problems, such as driving forward until we hit something, or just before that, how to turn accurately at 90 degrees. Combining those solutions, we were able to solve more advanced missions, breaking complex problems into tasks that are easier to manage is an important skill, part of the computational thinking skill that is very much linked to computer science, but can help us with almost any problem. Now that we have seen what we can do using the, the while loop. Let's have a look at our new and improved rule book. As for sensors, we were able to use three different sensors today. And we can add what we've learned about those sensors into our rule book. We have the touch sensor and the gyro sensor, and last but not least, the ultrasonic sensor. There is still much to learn and even more so to practice. I would like to recommend that you check out the Coding Robots curriculum. You can find it in Coder Z homepage. Just check under Learn and check out Coding Robots. Click on it and it will open the curriculum for you. You can also try out new missions as you acquire new knowledge. You can also access our support articles from within Coder Z. Just click on the help and type any keyword. Let's try out gyro and we'll find an article explaining more about the gyro sensor, how it works, and how to use it in code. You can also leave us a message if you need additional support.
So let's recap this intensive session. Grab a cold one if you have, you deserve it. We started out with driving the robot using just one block, the almighty drive block. We then looked at a program with a repeat while loop and examined the condition which makes it tick. Conditions usually consist of a comparison between a current sensor reading and a set value, which we often call a set point or a threshold value. These conditions can easily be modified to create different algorithms and behaviors of the robot. They give us, the programmers, great control over the robot. Let us know in the chat box how this session went. 10 is great, but constructive feedback is also important, as we want to make this the best use of your time. Thank you very much. I will let Michael take it from here. And again, like the previous session, we will reserve time for additional questions and answers. So stay online. Thank you, Adi, for another great presentation. Before we open it up for questions, we would like to thank all of those who took advantage of our June promotion. As for the rest of you, there's still time to take advantage of this exclusive deal. For orders placed in June, we're offering an exclusive discounted classroom bundle. This bundle includes the Coding Robots curriculum and 24 annual subscriptions to Coder Z. We are offering the bundle for just $600. We are also offering a one semester pricing at $360. To take advantage of this special promotion, either reach out to us for a quote or use the promo codes in our online store. You can also schedule a one-on-one -on -one meeting by clicking on the Calendly link we will share in the chat window. Now, let's take some time to go through the questions. I'm gonna give everyone a few minutes now to get their questions in, and then I will read them to Adi to answer. We have a question from Sarah. I have EV3 Lego robots. Can this help with that? Hi, Sarah. Um, well, if you already have EV3 robots available, then this can definitely help. First, you can download Coder Z code directly into your EV3 code robot. You need to use Lejos, which is an operating system for the EV3 that supports Java. There is information about it in our support articles, and you can connect with us and we can guide you through this very basic process. The big advantage is for students to be able to log into CoderZ, practice at home, and come prepared for the lesson and download their code to the EV3 robot. Thank you, Adi. We have another question here from Kurt. Can we get a copy of the Google slideshow that is being used during the webinars? The webinar is being recorded and you will get a recording of the session. We will create a, a, a more user-friendly version of these presentations uh, to share with you. All right. We have a question, another question from Kurt. Why is the gyro sensor positive and negative reading backwards from a physical robot? Physical uses positive to the right and negative to the left. That's a very technical question. I'll, I'll try to be brief. Uh, the reason is the difference between how LEGO education implemented the gyro sensor and how the LEGOS, which is the Java operating system, system implemented the gyro sensor. So it's a bit arbitrary, um, but it, it is not that important, I think. It's just making sure we understand what direction creates what value. Great. We have a question from Anna. From which age could children learn programming with Coder Z? Well, it depends on where you want to reach with Coder Z. Coder Z is low floor, high ceiling. You can start with very basic programming with students as early as fifth and sixth grade. Great. But if you want to go into the more interdisciplinary value of STEM, of course, at higher ages, as middle school, you can get more benefit out of Coder Z. Coding Robots curriculum is aimed for middle school students. Thank you, Adi. 
we're going to be wrapping up soon, so I'll give people a few more minutes to get in those last minute questions. The semester subscription uh, is for up to 24 students. You can purchase multiple semester subscriptions for more students. You can use those 24 students in more than just one classroom, so you can divide the student and spare the classes that you have. But the total available seats you will get buying the promotion would be of 24 students. If you need additional seats, please contact us directly and we will prepare a quotation just for you. We have another question from Martin. In which case do you need to reset the gyro sensor? Okay, we have an option to reset the gyro sensor. Reset would mean that instead of accumulating the turn angle, it will start again from zero. It is very useful when we want the robot to turn at a relative degree and not at an absolute degree. I'll give a short example. I want the robot to go in the shape of a square. Go forward, turn 90 degrees. Go forward, turn 90 degrees. In this case, I would need to reset the gyro sensor at each turn to make sure that it goes to the value of minus 90 and not to minus 180 and such. Um, it's a bit difficult to explain verbally, um, but we can, through email or chat, uh, provide more information on that. Great. We're going to end with this question. We have a question from Gabriella. How does the Coder Z see the concept of formative assessment? And how does it integrate this concept into the coding robots curriculum? I strongly believe in the concept of formative assessment. And one of the things that we want to do in Coder Z is bring in the, the coding robots curriculum with questions in the form of formative assessment. The main value of Coder Z is that it allows the students to test out their hypothesis before providing an answer. So this hands-on experience, immediate feedback from the simulation promotes the student's ability to provide better answers in formative assessment as they can not only test their knowledge, but their understanding. Um, it is not yet something that we can show, but it is something that we are taking quarters in, in that direction and we'll be happy to discuss this more and see how you view formative assessment being a part of coding robots. Thank you, Adi. So our time is up today. If you have any uh, more Michael? questions. Yes. Uh, I see we have another question from uh, Edmund. OK. Uh, we have a question from Edmund. Does the annual subscription for 24 seats have a fixed or user-defined start date? For example, can the year start on September 15th? Yes, no problem, Edmund. You can uh, determine the start of the subscription period. It will be either for a semester or for a full year, and we'll accommodate that start date. Excellent. OK, so it, of course, if you have any more questions, you can be in touch with Adi. He'll be more than happy to answer any of them. On behalf of the entire Coder Z team, I want to thank you all very much for joining us today and for your great participation. We look forward to meeting you again next week for our next workshop webinar. Have a great day. Goodbye, everybody, and thank you.